All right, I think we're live. Okay, so altitude medicine. Um, I have no conflicts of interest, although I do have a habit of trying to induce exercise or altitude sickness in myself. I tried, I ran a 25K on Mount Bachelor at 9,000 feet, no symptoms. I hiked in Cusco at 11,000 feet, no symptoms. And I went for a run on Mont Blanc at 15,000 feet and still no symptoms. So I clearly do not have the gene. Okay, so what is uh, what are we going to talk about today? So first, we're going to talk about what is altitude. We need to be able to define it so we can then medicalize it. Um, we'll talk about normal physiology and the changes that take place in our body at altitude, and then we'll talk about altitude-related pathologies, including treatments and preventions. And last, the most fun stuff, I really want to talk about training and competing at altitude because uh, some of the data is different than I think what we expect and what we see in the community. All right, so let's talk about altitude and normal physiology. So low altitude is anywhere from 500 to 2,000 meters. So here in Los Angeles, we are at sea level. Uh, moderate altitude is 2,000 to 3,000 meters. Uh, high altitude is 3,000 to 5,500 meters. And then extreme altitude is anything above 5,500 meters. We also anticipate changes in the atmosphere as we move up. And this is why altitude is a problem. So at sea level, our barometric pressure is 760 millimeters of mercury and our PaO2 is between 90 and 95. So life is very good at sea level. And then as we move up, the barometric pressure goes down and the partial pressure of oxygen also goes down. So once we get to extreme altitude, our barometric pressure has come way down to 253 and our PaO2 is a measly 28. Um, uh, those altitude numbers, by the way, are in meters. So we're used to thinking in feet as we climb mountains and ski, et cetera. So what are our medical concerns at altitude? Um, you can have cold injuries. The higher you go, the colder it tends to get. So frostbite, hypothermia. Uh, we see dehydration. We see disordered sleep, depressed immune function, increased risk of thrombotic events. And we've seen this amongst our UCLA athletes and then increased risk of sunburn. So normal physiology, uh, the oxygen content, remember, is 21% at all altitudes, right? So that's a percent. But the atmospheric pressure decreases with increasing elevation. So again, the sea level, our atmospheric pressure is 760 millimeters of mercury. At 10,000 feet, it's 534 millimeters of mercury. So while the percentage of oxygen in the air is the same, the amount of molecules in the air become fewer, right, as we move higher. So the volume of air inhaled by the lungs is containing fewer oxygen molecules at higher altitudes. So what is the pathologic effect of altitude? So this is caused by acute exposure to a low partial pressure of oxygen at high altitude. So that decline in the partial pressure of O2 leads to impaired oxygenation. Now note, the transfer of oxygen from the alveolar space to the pulmonary capillary is determined by the partial pressure gradient. So if there's less oxygen in the alveoli than in the pulmonary capillary, they're going to diffuse the other way, right? So the absolute altitude is uh, as important as the rate of ascent, and we're going to talk a little bit about that in a minute. So uh, to give you a little bit of PTSD from medical school, we remember our oxygen dissociation curve. This is our hemoglobin's affinity for oxygen. And there are a number of things that are going to shift that to the left and a number of things that are going to shift that to the right. Remember, shifting to the right is going to reduce hemoglobin's affinity for oxygen. So this is increasing 2,3 dpg, increasing temperature, and decreasing pH. Shifting the other way is decreasing BPG, decreasing temperature, and increasing pH. And so this is what happens to our oxygen hemoglobin dissociation curve as we increase uh, our arterial oxygen tension with ascent. All right. So uh, this green line is our high partial pressure of oxygen, somewhere 90 to 95%. And we've got lots of really good saturation. 
As we move down to 8,000 feet, this falls off. As we move down to 15,000 feet, this falls off. As we're up at 28,000 feet now with 30% PaO2, our oxygen binding is way, way down from 100% to 60%. That is a problem. And then remember our pH, as we climb, we're gonna become a little bit alkalotic. We'll talk about why, and that's gonna shift you even more. Uh, so we'll talk a little bit about what's happening there. Okay, but first, what is the effect on exercise capacity? So yeah, we all know VO2 max. VO2 max decreases by 1% for every 100 meters you ascend over 1500 meters. During submaximal exercise, your ventilation, heart rate, and lactate levels are all going to be higher. And however, over a three-week period at altitude, acclimatization is going to improve submaximal work at altitude. So let's recap that again. Our VO2 max, that maximum horsepower, is going to start to decrease above 1,500 meters. 1% for every 100 meters. And you can do that math about how quickly you're really dropping off a lot of VO2 max. Uh, for submaximal exercise, so this is going for a jog. This is not one rep max on the bench. Your ventilation, heart rate, and lactate levels all go up. But with acclimatization, all that work gets easier. So acclimatization serves to minimize any decrease in tissue oxygen delivery so human performance is maintained or improved back to that of sea level. Uh, it affects two determinants of tissue oxygen delivery, so the arterial oxygen content and cardiac output. And it's modified by this hypoxia-inducible factor 1 alpha. Um, so acclimatization takes place in a hypobaric, hypoxic environment. Within minutes, so think of when you get off the plane in Denver or Salt Lake City, your ventilation goes up, your heart rate goes up, and cardiac output goes up, and your pulmonary vasculature vasoconstricts. That's going to slow blood flow through the pulmonary vasculature and allow more oxygen to diffuse from the alveoli. So that's within minutes. Now, days to weeks after, we get more long-lasting changes. So the kidneys are going to increase erythropoietin production. So that's going to increase our hemoglobin concentration. We're going to increase our mitochondrial density within our cells. And we're going to increase the capillary to fiber ratio, as well as the fiber cross-sectional area and myoglobin concentration in our muscles. So these are all changes that are going to allow us to push more blood into the musculature. So what we ultimately see is an increase in our hemoglobin concentration, an increase in those two, three DPG levels that are going to shift our dissociation curve back to the right. We see an in, subsequently an increased affinity of uh, hemoglobin for O2, increased tissue O2 extraction, remember? So now we've got more blood vessels in our musculature, and so our musculature is going to be better suited to pull more oxygen out. And then our cardiac output will start to decrease, our stroke volume will start to decrease, and our maximal heart rate will start to decrease as we acclimatize. Also, the kidneys will excrete bicarb to normalize our tissue pH. Do you guys know why we need to do that? All right, I'll tell you. So as you go up to altitude, you increase your ventilation rate. Remember, as soon as you get off that airplane, as you are increasing your ventilation rate, you're blowing off more and more CO2, which is going to change the pH of the blood. Okay, so now let's talk about altitude illness. Now that we kind of understand basally what's happening as we ascend to altitude. Altitude illness, like many other things we see, is a spectrum, okay? Starting from acute mountain sickness, high altitude pulmonary edema, high altitude cerebral edema, all the way up to acute hypoxia. And there are distinct altitudes at which we will expect to see these symptoms. Acute mountain sickness is almost never seen below 7,000 feet, most commonly seen 9,000 feet and above. For HAPE and HACE, similarly, 9,000 feet and above before you're going to start to see those. And acute hypoxia, you're way up at 18,000 feet. And there are very classic symptoms you'll expect for each of these that we'll talk about in detail. But this is a really nice study guide for you as you prep for the boards.
Dr. Goldman, really quick, is yeah. is that are those numbers like do those numbers change depending on what you live at? So if you like live at sea level, are you do those numbers like decrease at all, or is it just your risk for developing these increases with the lower you live? Or uh, exactly. So living at sea level is a risk factor. Okay. Living or actually being born in the mountains is actually a protective factor. And there's, if you look at the, some of the world's fastest runners, most of them were born and, and grew up at altitude, which is really interesting. Okay. So what are our risk factors? Excellent question, Brian. Number one, like most things in medicine, if you've already had it, you are more likely to get it again. So previous history of high altitude sickness. Number two, fast ascent. So going from sea level to 15,000 feet in a single day. Uh, number three, sleeping at high altitude. So in many instances, we will say go ski at very high altitudes, but then come down to the base of the mountain to sleep. But sleeping at high altitude in and of itself is a risk factor. Residents at an altitude below 900 meters. So if you are a sea level dweller, you're at increased risk. Uh, genetic factors, so there are a number of genetic predispositions, uh, history of cardiopulmonary disease, high exertion at altitude, and uh, of importance, fitness is not protective. So as I mentioned, when I have tried to induce uh, altitude sickness, me being in shape or not in shape isn't a risk factor, it's, it's these other things, uh, and obesity, but again, for mechanisms other than fitness. Uh, so they did a really nice study. They surveyed 3,000 physicians who went to a conference in Colorado. So it was uh, just above 6,300 feet. 25% of attendees developed acute mountain sickness. 65% of those who had symptoms developed those symptoms within 12 hours of ascent. And the risk factors they found in that cohort were residents below 900 meters, prior acute mountain sickness, age less than 60, which is interesting, a history of pulmonary disease, and then self-reported poor physical condition. So in this case, maybe conditioning or fitness level was important. Going back to this age less than 60, any guesses as to why? This is one of those few pathologies where I thought being old was supposed to be a problem, right? So the theory is resting metabolic rate. So the resting metabolic rate of a 20 year old is going to be much higher, right? And then subsequently that oxygen demand second by second, minute by minute is gonna be higher in a younger person than an 80 year old with a, a lower resting metabolic rate. So they, they have a lower oxygen burn at baseline. Um, okay, so as we accumulate all this data about risk factors, we've been able to develop risk categories, and these are low, moderate, and high. So if you see a patient in clinic who's planning to hike Kilimanjaro and you're trying to help them risk stratify and also plan their trip, you need to identify what risk category do they fall in. These risk categories have a little bit to do with history, but most to do with ascent plan. So those with low risk are individuals who have never had any altitude illness and are ascending no higher than 2,800 meters. So seven, 8,000 feet. Uh, individuals taking greater than two days to arrive at 2,500 to 3,000 meters with subsequent increases in sleep elevation less than 500 meters, 1,500 feet a day. So part one is they're not going very high and they've never been sick. Part two is they actually have a smart ascent plan. So they're gonna take a couple of days to get up to their starting climbing height. So 9,000 feet. And then subsequently, they're not going more than 1500 meters higher per day. So these are low risk. Moderate risk are people with prior acute mountain sickness who are ascending to 25 to 2800 meters. People without mountain sickness, but are going higher than 2,800 meters in a single day, or individuals going more than 500 meters per day above 3,000 meters. So people with a probably not great plan. And then the high risk category are people who have had acute mountain sickness going greater than 2,800 meters in a single day. Anyone who has had high altitude pulmonary edema or cerebral edema, anyone going to greater than 3,500 meters in a day 
people ascending greater than 500 meters a day at altitudes above 3,500 meters, and then a very rapid ascent, which is very open-ended. Uh, so the high-risk people are people with a bad plan or who have had bad outcomes before. So those people, you'd want to say, just come up with a better plan. So ascent rate. Uh, we recommend that you do not ascend more than 500 meters per night above 3,000 meters, and that's because lots of bad things happen above that. Um, we also recommend at least one night at an intermediate altitude, so 15 to 2,500 meters on your way to very high altitude. So get to 1,500 meters, spend a night. The next day, you can travel to that higher. So again, giving your body a little bit of time to acclimatize. And then at every, for every thousand meters you climb, you need an additional day of rest. Um, the training mantra is climb high, sleep low. So if you're doing some kind of climbing adventure, if you have, say it's not, you know, Mount Everest, if you have the opportunity to climb for your daytime activities, whatever they may be, and then descend for sleeping, your body will feel much better. Okay, so let's talk about acute mountain sickness. This commonly develops at altitudes greater than 3,000 meters, but can be as low as 2,000 meters. Uh, symptoms include headache, loss of appetite, nausea, vomiting, fatigue, weakness, dizziness, lightheadedness, sleep disturbance, confusion, disorientation, apathy, impaired memory, and mood swings. These symptoms may sound familiar because it's concussion symptoms, right? We have alterations of the uh, cognitive and cerebral function. Usually begins within 12 hours of arrival, but often subsides over the following two to three days if you have no further gain in altitude. So pretty quick onset, but if you stay, your body can acclimatize and symptoms should subside. Uh, this occurs between 25 and 67% of people. Um, your diagnostic criteria include the presence of a headache, and an unacclimatized person who recently arrived at altitude, so again, not other obvious causes for these symptoms, and then they have to have one or more. So you got a headache, new to altitude, and GI symptoms, insomnia, dizziness, or lassitude or fatigue. So this is symptoms without findings, meaning you feel bad and we work you up and nothing has happened. Again, sounds very much like concussion. Uh, pathogenesis is not definitively understood. There are a couple different working theories. The most prevalent of which is that hypoxia-induced cerebral vasodilation, right? So not enough oxygen to the tissues, the cerebral vasculature vasodilates. Um, the hypoxia may alter the permeability of that blood-brain barrier, predisposing to vasogenic cerebral edema. Uh, Descent to lower altitudes results in rapid resolution of symptoms. And again, there is no very uh, easy way to predict who's gonna develop acute mountain sickness because of this individual variability and in physiologic response to hypoxia. Uh, now, we do, your acute mountain sickness really is a diagnosis of exclusion. You've got to think of all the other potential bad things that could cause these similar symptoms. Because remember, this is symptoms without uh, any findings. So you can get a headache at high altitude. So that would just be a headache, no other symptoms. Viral illnesses, dehydration, exhaustion, hypothermia, carbon monoxide poisoning, very common in cabins. Uh, migraine, alcohol hangover, think of people on their ski trips, and then medication side effects. Uh, so treatment, you stop your ascent. First and foremost, go no higher. Rest, hydration, ibuprofen, and aspirin can help symptomatically. Um, if symptoms are more severe, an immediate descent of 500 meters or more will result in rapid resolution of symptoms. Supplemental oxygen can be really helpful. Um, I'll never forget when we were staying in Cusco, uh, most of the hotels actually have oxygen tanks on hand for anyone who gets um, mountain sickness. Portable hyperbaric chambers, you know, if you have one of those laying around are super helpful. And then uh, as clinicians, we need to be closely monitoring for progression to more uh, concerning pathologies. There are also medications we can use. So acetazolamide, which is a carbonic anhydrase inhibitor, um, 
is effective as a treatment, and then dexamethasone as well, again, targeting that cerebral edema, but there is risk of hyperglycemia and then rebound sickness when you stop it. So azetazolamide really is your first line. Uh, and then, of course, you can use antiemetics for nausea or vomiting. The acetazolamide mechanism, I think, is really interesting. It sort of targets many of the issues, but uh, it helps with bicarbonate diuresis. It stimulates ventilation. It increases PaO2 formation, and it promotes ion transport across the blood-brain barrier. So really multifactorially uh, treating the pathologies associated with acute mountain sickness. Okay, so prevention is key. Right, and everything we do in sports medicine, if we can counsel our athletes and our patients about prevention strategies, you know, say the person who has the high risk ascent plan, um, we can make a big difference. So first you wanna slow your rate of ascent, no more than 500 meters a day. Number two, climb high, sleep low. So if you have the ability to descend for sleep, your body will do much better. Uh, hydration is really important, again, because of the diuresis that we're seeing with the bicarb loss. Um, you want to avoid alcohol and sedatives. These uh, also can have a diuretic effect. You want to limit your level of exertion for the first few days when you arrive. And then acetazolamide can be used as prophylaxis in susceptible individuals. Now, I want you to envision a group of friends going to the mountains to ski. They show up on a plane, so they have not slowed their rate of ascent. They do play high and sleep low. You typically get dehydrated on the mountain, then you drink a bunch of beers afterwards, and nobody's sitting around for 72 hours once they get to Vail before they start skiing. So ski trips are really uh, setting you up for this issue if you're skiing at pretty high altitudes. Okay, so people who have had acute mountain sickness or have a bad plan, there are a number of preventive medications. Acetazolamide, again, is a really good prophylaxis. You should begin it one day prior to ascent and continue it for your first two days at altitude. So three days total. Uh, dexamethasone, also you can do two milligrams every six hours uh, or four milligrams every 12 hours. And then ginkgo biloba, the clinical studies are mixed, but for your Santa Monica West Side naturalists, it's a reasonable recommendation. Uh, okay, so let's talk about high altitude cerebral edema. So this is the bad stuff um, that can happen. This is probably an end stage form of acute mountain sickness. Uh, this is a clinical diagnosis that is made from a change in mental status in the setting of acute mountain sickness or ataxia and a change in mental status without preceding acute mountain sickness. When uh, high altitude cerebral edema occurs, it is frequently associated with high altitude pulmonary edema. So have a very high suspicion for the both concurrently. The incidence luckily is much lower. So 1.25% of people at 3,500 meters. The most con the, the mean altitude at which we see it is 5,000 meters. So we're pretty high, it's 15,000 feet. Um, it often occurs with severe high altitude pulmonary edema. So 66% of the 39 cases in this case series had both. 20% um, had a prior history of high altitude cerebral edema and the mortality is high, 13%. Uh, proposed mechanism here is a combination of vasogenic and cytotoxic edema. So it starts as this acute mountain sickness, vasogenic edema. Then we start to get cell lysis. And now it becomes cytotoxic as well. And, and you get this cyclic pattern. And then you get death secondary to brain herniation. Uh, clinical features. So onset occurs within one to 13 days at altitude, but the mean onset is five days. So this is not happening as acutely as acute mountain sickness. Uh, they'll have ataxia, severe headache, vomiting, disorientation, and papilledema. And on CT scan, you will see cerebral edema. So if you guys remember, this is your normal brain. And then uh, the picture on the bottom, you have lost all of those gyri and sulci. Uh, treatment is immediate descent, high flow oxygen, hyperbaric chamber, and get them on steroids. So dexamethasone as an adjunct. Acetazolamide, typically the horse is out of the barn and it works a little too slowly. And then again, high suspicion for pulmonary edema, so treat concurrently. Prevention strategies are similar to those with acute mountain sickness. Anyone with 
prior high altitude cerebral edema should not go above 10,000 feet. Again, with a 13% mortality rate, this is not something we want to roll the dice on. So <clears throat> high altitude pulmonary edema is non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema with excessive pulmonary hypertension and elevated capillary pressure. Remember I told you that when you first arrive at altitude, one of the changes that we see is pulmonary vasoconstriction to slow the passage of blood through the lungs to allow for enhanced oxygenation. This actually accounts for most deaths from high altitude illness is HAPE. So high altitude pulmonary edema is an uh, excessive amount of that vasoconstriction leading to pulmonary edema. So this is not cardiogenic. Uh, clinical features, onset is quicker, so 24 to 72 hours. Patients will have fatigue, a dry cough, dyspnea at rest, and all, uh, so sorry, dyspnea at rest and hemoptysis are uncommon. So truly that fatigue and dry cough. They'll have fever, tachycardia, tachypnea, cyanosis, and rails. Their PaO2 uh, is about 40, and chest x-ray will show these classic patchy infiltrates. Of patients with high altitude pulmonary edema, 50% will have acute mountain sickness. So if you have acute mountain sickness, very likely to have pulmonary edema, but not necessarily the other way around. And 14% will have haze. Okay, so your pulmonary edema diagnosis. Uh, recent altitude gain plus two signs and symptoms related to respiratory status. So symptoms include dyspnea at rest, cough, weakness, decreased exercise tolerance, chest tightness, or congestion, plus crackles or wheezing, central cyanosis, tachypnea, tachycardia, and chest x-ray with patchy infiltrates is diagnostic. Okay, so two physical signs and symptoms. Now, I would argue that when I get to altitude, I have decreased exercise tolerance, but I shouldn't have crackles, wheezing, central cyanosis. I may have a little bit of tachycardia. I may have a little tachypnea, okay? So that's why you got to rely on your chest x-ray here. These are chest x-rays of patients with high altitude pulmonary edema. And you can see these really localized uh, areas of vascular congestion in the lungs. Uh, so incidence at 3,500 to 4,000 meters is 0.6% of adults but 8% of children under 16 years of age. So there's something about children that makes them much less tolerant of the altitude. This is rarely occurring uh, below 2,400 meters. So one in 1,000 skiers at Val uh, will experience it, and that's at 2,500 meters. Um, risk factors are similar to acute mountain sickness, um, plus cold temperatures. So cold also seems to be a risk factor. 70% uh, will have had some symptom of acute mountain sickness in the past. And then mortality is 11% of all cases. So this is the most deaths, again, from high altitude. You're asking yourself, but well, you said 13% mortality with cerebral edema and 11% with pulmonary edema. Why are there more deaths? Because this is more common. Uh, the proposed mechanism, again, is that increased pulmonary capillary permeability. There are three sub-theories. So West in 92 said this is a stress failure of the capillaries. Then Krasny, two years later, said that this actually represents a form of neurogenic pulmonary edema mediated by increased sympathetic activity due to insufficient ventilatory response. And then Holtgen, 96, two years later, said, actually, it's this uneven pulmonary vasoconstriction leading to areas of overperfusion and capillary failure. And this tends to be the most accepted because if we go back to our chest x-rays, why is it patchy, right? Why is this not diffuse? And so they think it's this uneven pulmonary vasoconstriction. Uh, susceptible individuals will have a previous history of high altitude pulmonary edema. So recurrence rates are as high as 60%. Um, so if you've had it once, don't risk it. Number two, they see an overexpression of vasoconstrictors, specifically endothelin-1, underexpression of vasodilators, so nitric oxide, and a reduced ability to transport sodium and water out of the alveoli. So how do we treat it? 
descend, descend, descend. You guys are, it's like heat illness, just stick them in an ice bath. At altitude illness, descend. Um, get them on oxygen, so high flow, or if you have a hyperbaric chamber, which many ski resorts will, um, this is gonna reduce the pulmonary arterial pressure. You wanna continue rest and oxygen for 48 to 72 hours and monitor them closely with a pulse oximeter. Um, nifedipine uh, has been shown to be helpful. Um, you can use O2 if it's not available or descend if not possible. So if you have nifedipine, get them on right away. You can add dexamethasone if they're not improving with nifedipine alone. There's a really cool study looking at inhaled nitric oxide. So I remember I told you that susceptible individuals under express nitric oxide. Well, if we give them nitric oxide, they improve. Uh, beta agonists have also been shown to be helpful. And then there's now this questionable evolving role of PD-5 inhibitors, sildenafil. Okay, so how do we prevent this? Slow your rate of ascent. You're going to hear this over and over again. You can consider nifedipine prophylaxis. Uh, in people that have risk factors, so uh, 20 to 30 milligrams every 12 hours. Uh, nitric oxide can be helpful, sildenafil, as well as selmeterol. Okay, so nitric oxide treatment, really nice study in 1996. You guys are probably noticing a cluster of research that happened in the 90s around this. Um, they studied the effects of inhaled nitric oxide in 36 mountaineers at a lab at 4,500 meters. Uh, Pulmonary edema developed in 10 of 18 uh, subjects with a previous history of pulmonary edema, but none of the others. So uh, previous history is the biggest risk factor. And then nitric oxide produced a larger decrease in pulmonary arterial pressures in those with a history of high altitude pulmonary edema and caused a shift in blood flow to the less edematous areas in the lungs. So uh, this is an individual before nitric oxide, and you can see, so yellow and red is really good blood flow, black is not, and so uh, this is a, an individual uh, prior to nitric oxide inhalation and then post, and you can see much better uh, airflow within the lungs in these areas that were um, hypoventilated previously. Uh, in terms of nifedipine prophylaxis, there was a study done in 21 climbers with a history of pulmonary edema ascending to 4,500 meters. The incidence was 7 out of 11 who received a placebo and 1 out of 10 who received the nifedipine. So pretty successful intervention. Uh, those who received nifedipine had lower mean pulmonary artery pressure and fewer symptoms. Okay, so as a quick study guide, these are your acute mountain sickness medication dosages. Um, acetazolamide, there's both prevention dose and treatment dose, uh, as well as dexamethasone, and that includes cerebral edema and pulmonary edema dosages. Return to play. So when can an athlete return to altitude sporting? So the athlete needs to be completely recovered from high altitude illness prior to participation. And if activity involves ascent, they must adhere to conservative ascent guidelines. So no more than really should be 500, but the guidelines are 600 meters per day, and they need to rest every two days for a 24 hour period. They should also take prophylactic medications um, specific to their pathology. Okay, there are also a lot of disorders that are affected by altitude. These include hypertension, COPD, a coronary artery disease, congestive heart failure, obesity, and sickle cell disease. So if you are traveling with a cohort of people that have these pathologies, you want to uh, make sure you counsel them in advance. There are a number of contraindications to um, altitude. So the absolute contraindications are uncontrolled angina or hypertension, severe COPD, previous severe altitude illness, sickle cell anemia or thalassemia, and clotting disorders. Your relative contraindications are the first and last weeks of pregnancy, controlled heart disease, the very young, as we saw uh, that increased risk of hape in children, and the very old because of comorbidities, severe obesity, uncontrolled diabetes, and recurrent mild altitude illness. Any questions before we jump into the fun performance stuff?
All right, we will keep trucking along. So uh, altitude is believed to help enhance performance. And so uh, th this stems from a couple of proposed benefits. Number one, it is proposed that acclimatization improves performance at altitude. That is true, and we'll talk about why. Uh, number two, the polycythemia and tissue enzyme changes induced at altitude will improve performance at sea level. That is not necessarily true, and we'll talk about why. Okay, so let's talk about research challenges at altitude. The benefits of altitude training are very difficult to study, especially in elite athletes, because the margin of improvement for an elite athlete to win a medal, so let's say to go from fourth place to any meddling place is 0.5%. The number of elite athletes you would need to study to detect that small of a change in performance is more than the number of elite athletes available to study. So this is a really hard problem to study in the elites. Subsequently, it's difficult to power, difficult to power studies appropriately. Okay, so let's talk about performance enhancement. Going back to your VO2 max, remember that is the cardiac output times the CA2 minus the CVO2. So this is your maximal aerobic power, which highly correlates with performance, specifically in endurance events. Um, blood doping or recombinant epigen increases your hemoglobin concentration and subsequently your VO2 max. As a result, it is banned by most organizations. So what happens to oxygenation at altitude? All right, so that CaO2, your hemoglobin, which is modifiable, your body will increase. So uh, hemoglobin concentration goes up. However, your PaO2 goes down. And so by increasing the hemoglobin, the body is attempting to compensate for that reduced PaO2. So these are the hematologic adaptations that we see at altitude, okay? And this we're monitoring specifically EPO levels, not hemoglobin. So you ascend day zero, within two to three days, we see a rapid spike in erythropoietin production, which quickly falls off and then re-equilibrates only slightly higher than your basal level at sea level. So the greatest bang for your buck with EPO production is actually in the first two to three days, which reaches a new steady state at three weeks. So hypoxia is going to increase your erythropoietin production naturally uh, within the first few hours of altitude, but again, is gonna decline somewhere within a week to three weeks. Your increase in RBC production will continue for two weeks post EPO spike. Then that increased hemoglobin increases VO2 max. The threshold altitude to increase your EPO is 2200 meters. So if you're doing this for performance enhancing purposes, you only have to go up to 2200 meters. Most importantly, though, you need building blocks for that EPO spike to be useful. So you have to have adequate iron stores prior to exposure to altitude if you wanna see hemoglobin production increase. All right, so submaximal exercise will cause a temporary increase above the steady state level in terms of your hematologic adaptations. The differences in hemoglobin concentration between residents at sea level and at 8,000 feet is about 12%. So if you're trying to think what's the benefit of getting to altitude, at 8,000 feet, you're going to have 12% more hemoglobin than the sea level dwellers. Healthy altitudes training and living at similar altitude will have a true increase of hemoglobin approximately 1% per week. Okay, so getting up to that 12%, if you want to get all the way there, it's going to take 12 weeks. All right, so now let's get into some of the studies. So this was a really nice study um, where athletes spent 26 nights living high, meaning living at altitude, and training low. Uh, group one lived high, trained low, and then underwent periodic phlebotomy. So remember, I just told you that the benefits of altitude are increased hemoglobin production. So group one, we are undoing that increased hemoglobin production with serial phlebotomy. 
So those, those athletes had no increase in their hemoglobin mass, nor their VO2 max, but they did see an increase in cycling maximal uh, four minute effort. What the heck? Group two lived high, trained low, and we left their blood alone. So they did have an increase in hemoglobin mass and VO2 max. They had a similar increase in their cycling maximal four minute effort, but they had a better time to exhaustion test at peak uh, power output. So it's better if we let you keep all your blood, but there are still physiologic adaptations beyond the hemoglobin increase alone from training at altitude. Okay, so additional uh, adaptations at altitude. Hypoxia causes a reduction in plasma volume up to 25%. So think increased risk of clotting. Uh, baseline and post-exercise aldosterone levels are both decreased. And we see a complete normalization of that plasma volume about two months uh, after descending. Uh, anaerobic performance will decline uh, because of a decrease in muscle mass and a decrease in maximal muscular power. So remember, people think acclimatization is all good, but your anaerobic performance is actually going to uh, decline at altitude. Endurance performance, however, improves after two to three weeks exposure. Okay, so now let's talk about using altitude for performance benefits. And there are three strategies for doing so. Live high, train high. This means you live in Denver. Live high, train low. This means you sleep in a hypobaric oxygen chamber and train at sea level. And then live low, train high. This is you live in Los Angeles and you wear one of those hypoxia masks that we see knuckleheads running around LA wearing. Okay, so model one, live high, train high. Think of cross country team goes to Mammoth. Mixed results. So some studies showed an improvement in VO2 max in performance. Other studies show an inability of the athletes to achieve equivalent training intensities leading to declines in performance. So let me, let me talk about that for a second. Because of tissue hypoxia and centrally induced reduction in exercise effort because of brain hypoxia, you just can't train as hard at altitude. So you get all of the benefits of hemoglobin and increasing VO2 max, but you lose some of the ability to train intensely and to sufficiently oxygenate all of your tissues, most importantly, your muscles, to have performance benefits. So while you're gaining in the hematologic aspects, you're losing in some of the performance training benefits. So here's a study where they looked at 12 middle distance runners divided into two groups matched by VO2 max. Uh, two mile runtime and age. Runners trained for three weeks at the same relative workload, half of them at sea level, half at 2,300 meters. And there was no improvement reported in VO2 max or two mile runtimes when the altitude guys came back down to sea level and raced their sea level compatriots. Okay, so model two live high, train low. And this is how you do it you live in Los Angeles and you sleep in a hypobaric chamber like this. This allows the intensity of training that is otherwise limited at altitude, but you get the hematologic benefits of acclimatization because you are hypoxic overnight, which is when you're producing the hemoglobin. So there are variable results in these studies. There is a trend towards small improvements in athletic performance. And as such, this is the go-to strategy for the elites these days. So here's one study, it looked at eight women, 14 men. They lived at 2,500 meters. They trained at uh, 1250 for 27 days. They had significant increases in hemoglobin and VO2 max, and their 3K run times improved an average of six seconds, 1.1%. For an elite, worth it. For me, probably not. Okay, this is a study of 39 college runners. They did a six week sort of washout training in Dallas to normalize their iron stores. All runners then underwent six weeks of sea level training camp. So then this is live low, train low, right? Just normal four week training camp. 
they improved their 5,000 meter time trial performance by 22 seconds. And this was what they call the training camp effect. You train, you get faster. Then they assigned them to one of three groups. Live high, train high, live high, train low, live low, train low. Uh, and you can see specifically what those training regimens look like. They brought them back to sea level and within 30 hours of returning, they did a time trial. Only the live high, train low group showed further improvements in performance. So 15 more seconds, 1.4%. That improvement maintained for three weeks at sea level post camp, but neither the live high, train high, or live low, train low improved anymore. So how do you bring the mountain to the athlete? This is the onset of these hypobaric chambers to induce the physiologic effects of high altitude. This is practical and less expensive than driving to the mountains to sleep and then driving home every day to train. Um, and you can address variations in individual response to hypoxia, meaning you want the minimal amount of hypoxia needed to induce your desired hematologic changes. So remember we were talking about the average altitude at which you'll start to see those changes. Well, you as an individual, want to know what that magic number is specifically for you, and you can adjust your hypoxia accordingly. Studies using this technique, so this intermittent hypoxic training, uh, have not shown consistent results, however. Okay, so here's a 2004 study, double blind randomized study of 14 elite runners, intermittent normobaric hypoxia versus placebo control for four weeks at rest all trained at sea level, and they had no significant difference in VO2 max, EPO, or 3K runtime. All right, so lastly is the live low, train high. These are sleep at sea level, wear a silly mask while you're training. Um, and the concept is at the altitude hypoxia exposure in smaller, more discrete time periods may stimulate training improvements. Um, this may be during resting state or with exercise training. It seems to be effective for pre-acclimatization purposes prior to competition or participation at altitude. So if you are competing at altitude, say Lauren wants to go skiing in Denver, training for skiing while hypoxic is helpful. But if you're going to race at sea level, then you should train at sea level. Okay, so let's talk about team travel to altitude. Um, you know, very commonly you will travel with teams uh, to places of altitude. For us at UCLA, we're either in Colorado or Utah every year. Um, for endurance events, you want to allow for three weeks of acclimatization prior to competition. And you remember all those hematologic changes that we talked about that will take about three weeks to re-equilibrate. For anaerobic events, think football, short bursts, or sprinting events, or in cases where acclimatization is not practical, you want to compete ASAP after arrival, because the longer you're there, the more consequences of that tissue hypoxia. So in an ideal scenario, you want to arrange for accommodations as close to sea level as possible. You want to avoid alcohol, encourage hydration. You want to identify potential medical issues in all your traveling staff. This is typically coaches, um, although we do have players with sickle cell trait and other hypercoagulable states. And then consider prophylaxis for susceptible individuals. Okay, so let's talk about competing at altitude, which is really interesting. Um, the density of air versus the altitude. So here at sea level, we have really dense air. And as we ascend to say 150 kilometers, much less dense air. So sprint and field events will benefit from the reduction in air density. Endurance performance declines, however, due to that reduction in your VO2 max. So this is actually a really interesting chart uh, that came out of the Mexico City Games. So the Olympics were in the Mexico City. They found 
improve so Mexico City here 2500 meters they found improvements in 200 meter 100 meter and 400 meter times but decreases in performance above 400 meters so as we make that transition from uh, anaerobic to aerobic and they believe that these increased performance times were actually because of the decreased density of the air that they were racing against. All right, so uh, let's talk about a quick review of altitude medicine. Acute mountain sickness and high altitude cerebral edema live along the same spectrum of pathology with cerebral edema representing the end stage form. High altitude pulmonary edema, remember, is non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema that accounts for most deaths at altitude. There are several different methods that have been studied uh, for altitude training. Live high, train high, live high, train low, live low, train low. And the live high, train low methodology has the most supporting evidence showing benefit. But remember that these important performance in improvement percentages are small. Competing at altitude can be helpful for sprinters and detrimental for endurance runners without sufficient acclimatization. Lots of references for you guys, and we will open it up for questions.